Luke chapter 21, the Gospel of Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. And take heed to yourself, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with for fainting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that they come upon you unawares. For like a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that he may be that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Then from first Peter chapter five. Peter chapter 5, we read the first 11 verses. The elders who are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight of it, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. In like manners, ye youngsters, submit yourself unto the elder. Ye, all of you, be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Finally, in First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 3, the first five verses. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy or, or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, but not covetous. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? With the thrust that you have before you here, Brother Elias, 
be on the line of now pleasure in the fact that you were called upon to take heed to yourselves lest your heart be laden with surfeiting, drinking, seems to imply this whole matter of the system of pleasure that man involves himself in, surrounds himself with, thinking that out of pleasure will come satisfaction. We didn't get satisfaction before in terms of uh, pulling down the barns and building greater. It was at that point in time that his life was removed and he had nothing left but to be face, to come face to face with God. Now this matter of pleasure seems to come out here and I wonder if we could connect since we've been talking about the kingdom of God here in Luke and the features that are connected with the kingdom of God and what are the conditions related to it. You remember there is a verse in Romans 14, right? In verse 17 that explains to us what the kingdom is all about. It says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So certainly, what we have before us now is really not a feature of the kingdom because it is not one of drink, of meat, of pleasure. In the parable of the rich man back in Luke, he was rich, but when the Lord addressed him, he became a fool. He was no longer rich with respect to the kingdom of God. He was rich in terms of the world. The Lord said, Thou fool, this night thy soul be required of thee. It came as though a complete surprise to him. He was taken aback. All this that I built up for myself, and all of a sudden, it's taken now. My life is taken. In this passage here, to the believer, there's no surprise that the Lord is coming. Hmm. And we are given, we're told by the Lord to be ready and to be vigilant. So the point here, the main point, I think, that should be the context in which we address the cares of this life is in view of the Lord's coming, are we ready with respect to being, having this ready mind, this mind set, which is not uh, distracted, preoccupied with the things of this life. I want to make one point, just to bring out how uh, the cares of this life is not something to be taken lightly, or to uh, just, you know, yeah, it happens to everyone. And I'll just bring it out in this way. If I was to go to Brother Siti and say, you know, Brother Siti, last night I got drunk. His reaction, I'm sure, would be, what do you mean you got drunk? <laughs> I, was, I drank too much wine. It's not becoming. And it's a clear and blatant sin, right? And that's one of the, the things mentioned in this verse, in verse 34. He says, overcharged with surfighting and drunkenness and cares of this life. I'll leave it to another brother to talk about the first point. But drunk. Now, if I come to Brother Siti, so I would get a very rough reaction, as I should. It's not becoming, but the same. But if I came to Brother Siti, you know, Brother Siti, I'm, I feel really anxious, and, and I have a lot of anxiety in my life over such and such. What kind of reaction? Would it be the same reaction as the drunken one? I think it would be different, probably. And, and it's not, it's not, and the point here is what does the Lord Jesus say and what group does he put them? He puts this, those three things in the same group and says take heed. And isn't that what we had in the last parable, prior to the last parable, he said take heed of covetousness. And here we have take heed that you not be overcharged or overburdened that your hearts are filled with these things, and specifically the cares of this life. 
just the meaning of the word. Uh, the word surfeiting is excess, excess, yes. especially in food, like mm-hmm. gluttonous. Mm-hmm. That's the, the, the main thing. So that's excessive food or excessive drink. Yes, it's anything that's done in excess. And that's the character of uh, what man is outside of God. He is extreme in every way. Whatever we do, we do to the zenith. Pleasure to the zenith. Riches to the zenith. If we're worrying, we also do it to the zenith in terms of cares. So, here the challenge is that we cannot afford to be obsessed with things of that nature because ultimately there is a day before us. Even though the setting here is more the setting of of a, a day yet future because our day, the, the uh, rapture, would have already passed this. But it is a challenge to us that we today, if we are characterized by the things here, then we are not looking for the rapture. We are more looking for our enjoyment here presently. What is in it for me here and now? And we lose total perspective of what is the greater picture, the coming of the Lord to take us to be with himself, where we will be fully satisfied when we awake in his likeness. But instead of that, we are seeking our satisfaction and enjoyment in the things here. It's as though we are looking to enjoy both worlds. And we can't have it. I can't have the world where Christ is head, while at the same time taking up the things of this world, because they just don't go hand in hand. And so we are challenged to, to have the day before us, the day of the rapture, as that which will liberate us from any entanglement that we have in this world. In Luke 12, where we were before, just the verse after where we ended, I believe it was, the verse in verse 35 says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. You know, your loins girded, if a man was, had girded his loins, he was ready to leave. Mm-hmm. He was ready to go. And if the lights are burning, that means you're ready in testimony, continuing, ready to depart, and having alertness and being aware and watching. And it's interesting from that verse on, the Lord gives some very interesting uh, warnings about the attitude of servants. And the servants should have an attitude of expectancy and longing for the master to come. And they should have a desire of alertness. They should be watching and alert. Because if they're not, they're like one who a thief comes and breaks in and they didn't even know when the thief the hour of the thief would come. But then the Lord says in verse forty two, and the Lord says, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Of the truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delighteth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat, that's the serpent, and drink, and be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and shall cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. It's very interesting. The Lord is showing the urgency and the importance of our attitude, of our hearts now, while we wait for that moment of His coming. As you mentioned, as we wait and long for Him, our treasure should be in heaven. Not that we're being driven because of things down here, that we're being driven to our home above. We should be drawn because that's where He is and we want to be with Him. Not to get away from What's happening here? There are two types of people in the, in the passage in uh, Luke 21. The unbeliever, and this is, uh, if we're to take it literally, it's to the saints on earth right before uh, the second coming of the Lord. Um, and so the, the, first, the type, the unbeliever is 35. They're going to be taken by it. It's going to be a snare to them when he comes. 
uh, on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. And these people are characterized by surfeiting and drunkenness and caring for this life. And they, they have nothing for God. And uh, they, uh, they will not escape. But to the other, to the, to the saint at that time, the Lord is addressing it, addresses them and says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time you be overindulging or, uh, or burdened with these things. And what characterizes this saint be a watchfulness, and again we have pray always. So we have the cure for anxiety. Bird, uh, being overburdened with prayer. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Uh, ask and you shall receive. We have the praying to, to, to as the cure uh, for that kind of carefulness. Can you imagine the, uh, the thoughts of those who are hearing this as we hear it today, but the the wonder of this, the anticipation of standing before the Son of Man. Mm-hmm. Just think of this. This is a marvelous thought. When we think of being in the presence of the Lord, we sometimes get kind of lulled to sleep and we don't think of this in a fresh way. But to, to be before the Lord, glory. To be before Him. To behold His glory. Mm-hmm. It's such a privilege. Such a privilege it is. It should affect us dramatically, our lives. To think that we not only now have been brought into relationship with God through faith in Christ, but we will one day behold the glory of God. Today we'd see it by faith. But in, just think in a moment, we'll be raptured from the scene and we'll behold the glory of the Lord in a full and wonderful way that we have never even begun to imagine. And so this is such a privilege, it should change us drastically. Why is it that we get lulled to sleep? <laughs> Surfeiting, drunkenness, and cares. <laughs> well, that is true, but I think even before doing that, there is a loss of, of interest, and that's why we turn to the surfe- surfeiting right. and the drinking and the cares, because we've begun to lose a sense of interest in spiritual things. And it is very easy, apparently, for that to happen with us today. That Christianity and the Word of God becomes kind of mundane. It no longer seems to have the freshness that it once had. Uh, We've been been easily giving up that which we once held on to tenaciously and as a result then we turn to the other things we turn to some because we need something to satisfy us and so if we're not using the word of God anymore then we're certainly going to turn to what is around us and in so doing we engage ourselves in that pattern of of drinking eating and pleasure and as and consequently There is no desire to look above. No desire to look for that day. Because it no longer has an appeal. So we need to get back to, to, should I say, Philadelphian love? Or maybe go back, first of all, to Ephesians love. Because it's, it's because we left that, that then we started a degenerative condition. And then there is the measure of recovery in Philadelphia. Having not denied his name and have kept his word. Because that's going to be the characters of this day that we were referring to here uh, on earth, the day after, after the rapture, when those who have kept his word and have not gone in drunkenness and surfeiting and caring, that day they, they will appreciate as they stand before the Son of Man. But for us now, we who are looking for the the day of the rapture, we are to keep that before us and not to lose perspective where that's concerned. And that is what will keep us from entering into conditions like this. These conditions here are to 
satisfy the body mm-hmm. rather than the inner, yeah. which was connected to the earlier discussion of uh, the confusion between the soul and the body of the rich man, the parable of the rich man. So all these th- things here, uh, uh, the gluttony and the drunkenness and uh, desiring riches really try to satisfy the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Rather than the inner man, it's more pleasant to the outer. And we have a society that drives that, you see. Uh, and that, I think, is one of our biggest dangers because we look at, we, we tend to use the society in which we live as the level uh, or the lever, whatever you call it, the, that, you, the, that you get leverage from. Uh, we tend to use that as our, our measuring rod. I'm trying to think of another word. It doesn't come to me at the moment. The plumb line, kind of, like that. Uh, our standard, yeah. We tend to use it as our standard. The world is our standard rather than Christ. You see? And because of that, that's where all things get lost because we are using the wrong plumb line. In a similar way, Paul takes this matter up in uh, Romans 13 at the end of this, at the end of the chapter. He says in verse 11, and that, or I'll read it from Darby, this also, it seems to give an added reason why to live for the glory of God. Uh, knowing the time. And in chapter 21 of Luke, they were to be knowing the time. And knowing the conditions. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. This relates to what you're saying, brother. This uh, spiritual lethargy that exists. It's time to awake out of sleep. Why? For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. And so the reality of the Lord's coming and the completion of that salvation is near. It's obvious. You, you just do the math. <laughs> when I believe, it's been so many years, it's got to be nearer. It is nearer. It's nearer than when I believe. Because look what he says. The night is far spent. The night of this present darkness is far spent. And the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The armor of light would repel darkness. And then he says something very beautiful. Uh, Let us walk honestly as in the day, as if this was the full blaze of of the day of his glory, the millennial day. Let us walk as if this was that day. Let us have that character of life, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but what? But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be everything in that day to come. To us, he should, if we put him on and let him be the regulating factor in our lives, he will be everything to us. So that we will not make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So this has the same principles in this little passage as we've been talking. Now if we make a practical connection to us presently out of Luke 21 as opposed to looking at it from the tribulation and millennial aspect and we're saying that the day we can connect that day to the rapture you ask yourself the question well what What am I doing in light of that day? How does that day presently grip me? Uh, Is there expectancy? Is there anticipation? But also I believe there is another day really that as believers we are to look for. And that is really the millennial day. Because that is really the next day that God has on his calendar, you know. God's program does not begin with the rapture as such. God's program begins with the next event, and it's the millennial event, the display of Christ. But to get there, the rapture comes in, moving us to glory. And then remember, in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says that them who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That is the millennial day. He's going to bring us back with Christ to be displayed. So the first day we should be looking for presently is the day of millennial glory. Why? 
because in that day of millennial glory God intends to display the man who was once rejected here on earth he intends to establish universal glory and honor for that man in a scene where he was dishonored then certainly to get there we have to be raptured so to what degree am I looking for that millennial day and Paul talks about it when he writes to Timothy he says a crown of righteousness is laid up for me and not for me only but for them that love his appearing so there should be a spirit of loving his appearing now but in light of that appearing we're going to have the rapture that will get us there so we must ask ourselves the question how do I value the days is the rapture an important day for me is the millennial an important day for me if it's so then two things will happen I would be living in light of the rapture and I'll be walking in light of the millennium and Brother Dave um, could we say then we have the Lord's Day presently that helps us to enter into these things that are future because we remember the Lord in light of His coming again but we also remember Him in light of the fact as He mentioned when He gave thanks to the cup that He would not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom is established so presently in this scene of His rejection there is that which he has given to us to bring us into the good of things future. And if week after week we come, we partake of the supper in light of his coming, we are doing it in remembrance of him, but we are doing it in light that he is coming again. And it will bring us into a day that Brother David is bring, uh, setting forth, that day when he shall be in full display. And week after week, as we who are in his own come together to remember him, we, are in, we ought to be in the good of these things. But what the supper does also, it adjusts me here in this scene. Am I, after partaking of the supper, realize that this world does not belong to me? I am not a part of this world. It is a world that has rejected and crucified my Savior. It is a world that has no idea that He is coming again. It's a world that has the foggiest idea that He, they are going to bow their knee to Him and own that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But because I belong to the Lord Jesus, what do I have in this world? Why do I want to set my states down in this life knowing that the Lord Jesus will take me out of this world and give me a part in his kingdom in a day to come? So I don't go surfeiting and dancing and drinking in a scene that has judgment upon it. Yes, I agree that the Lord's Day is a wonderful day and I don't know how much we appreciate the fact that the Lord's Day is anticipatory of the blessed days that are yet to come. I think if we did, we would have a greater excitement because each Lord's Day as we sit at the supper is a little sort of a miniature uh, indicator of what is yet glorious to come the glorious day of his millennium, the glorious day of our being raptured uh, into his presence, is all captured in just the hour and 15 minutes thereabout that we spend together in the supper. So that should propel us in desire and affection to wait anticipatively for the rapture for the millennial day. So we should get a foretaste. When we eat of the cup, the, uh, eat of the loaf tomorrow, God willing, we are, as it were, entering in upon the blessedness of a body that was on earth for the pleasure of God. No body like that body. When we drink of the cup, we are, as it were, drinking into what is millennial in character. Because remember he says, 
this cup is the new covenant, new testament in my blood. It's bringing us into what is millennial in character. The blood has inaugurated the millennial day. It is the basis of how the millennial day is going to be enjoyed. The basis of blood. And he says, this is my, uh, the new covenant in my blood. And we are therefore to have the enjoyment of what is millennial as we sit here tomorrow. And that will propel us on to looking with expectancy for that day. And Peter, just to touch on this, Peter also would motivate the people of God to looking for and hastening the day of God. Mm -hmm. So we as saints have an awful lot to look forward to. <laughs> we look forward to the rapture, we look forward to the millennial day, that magnificent time of 1,000 years of the reign of Christ, but we look forward to the day of God when all things will be new and where there will be no more sin and where righteousness will dwell. And we look forward to all these things that God will bring in by His own authority and power. So what a, what a motivation for us to live differently. Yeah, but Peter says, Brother John, he says that we can hasten the day. Hasten the day yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. What do you mean we can hasten the day? You mean something that I can do will bring the day faster? Mm -hmm. Really, that's what Peter is saying. The way I live in expectancy of that glorious eternal day will move the hand of God in a sense if the saints are living in the expectancy of it it will move the hand of God to move the day closer it's perception isn't it excuse me it's perception too how we perceive yes. the day the closer we see him uh -huh. coming Okay. The, more, the shorter the time will be. <laughs> well, in that sense, yes. <laughs> First Peter 5, when he addresses the elders, they, there is also here the thought in verse 4, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, mm -hmm. in view of his appearing. Now, I think, is this for the rapture or for the second coming? Yes. We know here. Well, when the chief shepherd is appearing, he shall, we shall receive an unfading crown of glory. I believe that this is part of the rapture because it's connected with the, uh, the judgment seat. Yeah. Okay. Because that is where we're going to receive uh, the unfading crown of glory. And the judgment seat is going to settle everything for the believer in terms of our works. Uh, Everything else has already been settled. The death of Christ, the blood of Christ, has settled conditions of our sins, right? Uh, the judgment seat is going to settle our works. That's where we're going to be rewarded. And the chief shepherd is the one who's going to be operating at the judgment seat. Because what happened? Well, we have the three characteristics of the shepherd, right? We have the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, John 10. And that is where we've come on to the the shedding of his precious blood and it has brought us into relationship with himself. But then we have the great shepherd as in Psalm 24. That's the characteristical feature of the great shepherd there. He is Psalm 23. He is there as the great shepherd caring for us. Uh, my Lord, the Lord's my shepherd. <laughs> Forgetting my scriptures here. The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. That's the great shepherd there. He is caring. What is he doing? He's providing pastures. He's providing uh, green, uh, green pastures. He's providing streams of water for refreshment. But then lastly, we get in chapter, in Psalm 24 which is connected with Peter here, the chief shepherd who is going to reward on the shepherds. And that's what we are presently under shepherds. But the chief shepherd at the millennial day, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ, is going to reward the under shepherds. And we also have this word appear here. It, usually appearing has to do when he comes in mm -hmm. power and glory. Mm -hmm. But it seems, I know in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it uses this for... So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear, the second time without sin unto salvation, 
It seems like when there is a more Jewish audience, a believing Jewish audience, the use of this term appear is made used more often. And here it's definitely connected with that in Peter, but it still carries with it both aspects of the coming of the Lord. The rapture and that second coming in glory are both present in this term. Yeah, very often the word appearing ties in the, the, the two aspects, yes. the, the, the uh, rapture and the millennial day. Uh, sometimes it's very distinct. I think more often in Timothy, it's, when it refers to the appearing, it, it often refers to the day of manifestation, uh, the millennial day. But usually it, there's a connection between, because the rapture is an appearing, and so is the millennial day an appearing. I think it's interesting in First Peter 5 that it, he's, the Lord is, is mentioned as shepherd, as the one who, who cares for his sheep. And uh, he even tells, Peter tells the shepherds uh, to feed the flock and, uh, and to, to do it not for, uh, for gain. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we think about verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, we have here the wonderful thought that we, we have the Lord Jesus as our shepherd, who indeed um, understands what we need, and he is uh, caring for those things, and he is active in the lives of his sheep. He's not like the hireling in uh, John 10, which is the very opposite, who it says here in uh, 10... Was it? Uh, I am the. Sh okay, the, verse 13, John 10 13. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. But the Lord Jesus does care for his very own. Isn't it wonderful to see, though, that the features of 1 Peter 5 uh, are very specific as to the care of the, the flock as to the care of the people of God it is not to be viewed as something where you exercise uh, out of order an overpowering presence over the flock you don't either go after them for base gain uh, you know to see what you can get from it see how much possessions you can earn because of the dollars that are being paid to you for doing your job, isn't it challenging to see this, especially in a, in a world, in a system in which we find ourselves in Christianity, where there are those in the mega churches today, and even in the lesser ones, who look at the monetary gain that can be had from having a congregation. You know, uh, the... the hundreds of thousands of dollars that come in each week and uh, the, those who are compensated magnificently because of the larger the, the larger the group you have the better chances for more financial gain so it is sad when you think of that and think of something like 1 Peter 5 where the spirit of God is so straightforward as to by, by, through Peter as to how the flock is shepherded it has nothing of personal gain it has all for Christ so if there is a multi-million multi-billion dollar organization that's making that kind of money you have to ask yourself the question what kind of shepherding really goes on and what's the motive isn't verses 5 and 6 really the essence of the proper way in which all of us, as you brought it earlier, lives can minister to one another, care for one another? If, it's not, if we're not clothed with humility, if we don't have an attitude of humility, really there is no service. If it's pride, if it's self personal gain, there's no humility there. The Lord is not being glorified in that circumstance. So here he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. This really levels all of us down in the right way 
to really, no one will lift up their head to exalt themselves because it says, if we do this, we may be exalted in due time. Not exalted the way man wants to be exalted, though. Exalted in, the, in God's purposes, in God's ways. It's interesting, too, that humility is tied to casting all your cares upon him, isn't it, in that verse? We, you know, go back to tie, uh, you know, humble yourselves, therefore, under the high, right hand of God that you may exalt you. Having, that because you've humbled yourself because you have, basically, having cast all your cares uh, upon him, for he cares for you. And so, this idea of uh, letting things go, because the pers- per- perspective, your perspective is, you can't do it all. You can't change. You can't add. You can't fix. But God can. And so why worry when you can pray? You see? And so you, you humble yourself. You put yourself in that position, and therefore you cast those cares. And, 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 and when you do that, then you're an example, right? Then you can help and lead. Because how can you lead or how can you shepherd? How can you help if you yourself are, have these, are tied up with anxiety and cares and don't know who your source of dependency is? Also, the reinforcement here in First Peter 5 with, uh, with Luke 21 of how the state of how we should be. Watch ye therefore and pray always is what uh, the Lord said in Luke 21. And here we have, uh, be sober, be vigilant. Watch ye therefore. It's, uh, be sober is the opposite of drunkenness. Sober minded. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a, so- and of a sober mind. And being vigilant is the watchfulness. So there's no uh, being lulled into sleep. This is not should not characterize uh, the believer, the saint. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it takes uh, great discipline and focus, not to be distracted by the things, the cares of this world, but to indeed have the Lord before us. But this whole matter of humility and exaltation, we have to be very guarded about it, right? Because I could be humble in a very false way. And thinking that, you know, well, out of my humility, God will exalt me, right? Well, God is the one who sees the heart through and through. So he knows the character of my humility. And it is in light of that that he will exalt He's not going to exalt me if, I, if I'm coming with false uh, humility to impress. He makes a judgment. A genuine sense of humility is going to be compensated from his perspective with exaltation. Right Now, this matter of watchfulness, we are introduced to the devil here, the enemy of our souls, not as an angel of light. You notice that? It is rather his character as a roaring lion, is when he comes with his viciousness, and you can tell him from afar, as he's coming with his vicious character, he says, now, take note of him, because he walks about, he has one objective, to devour. So your watchfulness, your vigilant character, uh, in prayerful spirit, will help you to discern him when he's coming in that, you will hear his sound afar off because of your watchfulness and you would be able to put into place that which is necessary to avert his attack. Just because it refers to him here in that lion character, it doesn't mean necessarily that all of his attack forms with the people of God is outright and ultra bold. Sometimes it's subtle and underhanded. Uh, We were noticing in our studies in the scriptures in the assembly that in Jude, that there are those that crept in unawares. Those are the, that's the subtle type. Mm-hmm. But then there were those that were quite out in the open. We read in Acts, those that rose up from among yourselves to draw away disciples after them. So there's all types of... And there's also the persecution from without. There's corruption and deception from within. So we have to be 
vigilant and sober on our guard against all the wiles of the devil. Yeah, but I was thinking, Brother John, here, though, he is more concerned not so much with the subtle character with which he comes, but more so warning us of the fact of his intent. Yes, devour. His intent is to devour. Oh, right, right, right. You know? Not so much even to quietly in, and insidiously get in between us and, and separate us out, but he's warning us. He says that he wants to eat you up. Yeah. He wants to eat you up. So you need to be watchful. Because when you hear his loud sound, know that that's why he's coming. So that he might just completely annihilate you. But who do we turn to? Sorry, the God of all grace. You know, that's, isn't that the wonderful contrast? Do you remember when the Apostle Paul was leaving uh, Ephesus, uh, heading for Rome? He called the Ephesian elders together. And he set things out before them. And then last but not least, he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. What a place to be commended to. When everything else seemed as though it's falling apart around. You know, there was one lasting, one stable uh, source to which you can go. And that is to God and to his grace. The unchangeable <coughs> character of things. And it seems as though that's the same thing that Peter here is commending these uh, dispersed Jews to. He says, it is to God, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory. So it gives us kind of a perspective as what is in view. We are looking forward to eternal glory, not just being glorified, as important as that is, but to a scene of glory. Because remember, the assembly exists in a system of glory. We presently have that glory upon us. We will come into the full realization of that later. But it is to a system of glory that we've been brought. And he says, I want you to know somewhat of that. It is the God of all grace who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. When he has suffered for a little while, he's going to make you perfect establish and strengthen you so that we don't need to have cold feet. That's the, the object of exposing us to the God of all grace. I just wanted the, uh, the analogy of the, the lion, the glory lion. Um, uh, if you've seen the PBS or the shows, you know, the thing of a lion is it, it roars because it doesn't care Okay, it makes noise and then it, it rests and it has its, uh, the pride around it. But when it attacks, it doesn't roar. You see, the thing is, it makes a lot of noise. It, it, you know, you see that the shows that they're there to pack and they're, they're, the lion roars. But what happens is when it attacks, it's very it, it, it's very stealth and very very mm -hmm. subtle. And so the, the it, it and because and the analogy is of course the spirit of God used here because it talks about the roar and vigilance or, or, or watching. In other words, if you like brother our brother said, if you hear the roar, then sure enough know that he's going to attack. Mm -hmm. And in the attacking though, it, it, what you're saying, I'm trying to see things together, is what Brother John was you're saying, is that it could be subtle. It could be and it could be swift. But he's there and he wants to devour, uh, Brother uh, Dave is saying, and he wants to attack. But how, when and how, that's why the term vigilance is there, is because we have to be careful. And so that goes for us all. Yeah, what I've read about the uh, lion, it's interesting that the, the male lion doesn't do most of the hunting. It's the females that do most of the hunting. The, the male lion roars to scare the prey and to move the prey into the path of the females who are waiting. Yeah. And this is the way the devil often works. He, he has many that do his dirty work. Yeah. And so he'll roar to scare the saints. But then he has others <coughs> ready to do oh. destruction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the last uh, passage in 1 Timothy 3, we see that if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. And I, I think we can parallel that with with First Peter 5 and we just want to see some characteristics here 
that uh, that are uh, similar to what we saw. We see that the husband of one wife are blameless husband, and then we see vigilant and sober again. And uh, the negatives, not given to wine, so not drunk, not given to drunkenness, and not covetous. Uh, we see that uh, being uh, associated with you know, the cares of this, this, this life and pleasure with the, with the wine and the riches. And so uh, this type of person uh, having these qualities will then know how to take care of the church of God. So he has to secure his household first. Because he's not going to be very effective taking care of the household of faith. Because what comes out of the our personal households will have its indelible effect on the local assembly and on the assembly at large. So I think there's a great thrust placed here uh, upon the last uh, fra- fra- uh, phrase of his uh, responsibility knowing how to conduct his house or how shall he take care of the assembly of God it's very very important I think this is a a piece that is very much lacking today among us in many ways where our households are lost to, to the world in very many cases an indifference to assembly exercises And as a result, we don't have the moral fortitude, the moral weight with which to be effective in the local assembly. It's good to note the verbs he uses in verse 5. When it comes to the assembly, he says, uh, to his house, he says, rules. For if a man knows not how to rule his own house, but when it comes to the assembly, he doesn't use this word, he uses care. Right. He take care of that church of God. Mm-hmm. This shows tenderness and uh, affectionate care to, to that mm-hmm. We thank you Lord for this day. We thank you for every sister and brother that came to be with us this, this day. We thank you for the words that you have reached our hearts with. And uh, we thank you for everyone who attended. And we pray for those who were not here for reasons you know, that you may be a blessing to them. And we ask Lord for a blessing for the rest of the evening, uh, for a word from thyself, and uh, for the fellowship we have afterwards. And we pray for those who travel uh, to their homes again this evening, that you give them traveling mercies. We commit our time uh, and ourselves in your faithful hands, in your precious name. Amen. Just uh, one thought on my mind. It's not going to be long at all. Just uh, something that uh, was very interesting to me as, as we looked at this. I was asking myself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the role of each in terms of this subject. And so... The question that Martha asked in Luke 10, Dost thou not care? Dost thou not care? She was asking the Lord Jesus. I'd just like to answer that in saying the Father cares, the Son cares, and the Holy Spirit cares. We have that triple uh, uh, affirmation as we leave and take this subject to heart when we think about the cares of this life and the riches and the pleasures that may entice us as believers and have the effect of choking the word, strangling it, it's good to put before us, the last thought we had is, is put the Lord before us in the threefold persons. First, the Father. If we look at, we've looked at it. This is more of uh, just a um, reminder. In uh, Luke 12, 
Dost thou not care? In Luke 12, verse 30. For all these things, verse 29, And seek ye not what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind, or a mind that's not rooted in faith, founded on faith. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. It's expected of the Gentiles, it's expected of the nations to worry, to have these anxieties. Your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. This is the Father's role. He knows. He knows about the things that the believer, not just the believer, but his sons are experiencing in this world. So here is the wonderful truth that the things we go through are not hidden from the Father's eyes. He knows very well. Then we have the Son who also cares. And we saw this just now in the, the son as the shepherd, not like the hireling who doesn't care. When trouble comes, he flees. He doesn't care about the sheep. But we have the son as the chief shepherd who cares for us. And as a result, we can, care, we can cast all our care upon him. Lastly, I just want to say about this Holy Spirit's role. And this one we really, we touched on a little bit, but uh, if we look at uh, Luke 12, I just want to read a few verses about the Holy Spirit. Luke 12, verse 11. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers... Take no thought, take you no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. So here, we have it in the negative, but it says here, Take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. When the pressure comes, when they put you before the powers, and the magistrates and they accuse you and they want to bring you down because of your faith why take no care because we have the Holy Ghost who will teach us how to respond and that's a wonderful truth in itself as well that the Holy Ghost is there to help us to deal with anxiety how? through prayer But not just any prayer, but praying in the Holy Ghost. And that's, if we can go to Jude, and uh, we'll just take two verses on that. Jude, towards the end there, uh, Jude, verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying... Also in Ephesians, we see another verse. After taking up the whole armor of God, it's not complete really, until verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Remember, anxiety is getting distracted and not focusing on the object of our faith. Not really giving him the preeminence in our hearts. And so we, we foster anxious thoughts. But the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers to direct them to the Father and to base our prayers on the truth of his word. So the word of God, the seed that is sown in our hearts with the Holy Spirit working together so that we can indeed Not be anxious and careful about the things of this life that want to choke out, to strangle the word of God that we're drinking as milk for the babes or taking in as solid food for the young men and the fathers. It can be choked out because of the cares. And so it needs to be replaced by prayer, 
but not just any prayer. Praying in the Holy Spirit. That's a comforting thought to me and very encouraging as I move forward. I know that the Father knows all that I have need of and that the Son cares as a shepherd, cares for his sheep. And then we have the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses and teaches us how to pray so that we can indeed bear fruit unto God, that we can be fruitful the hundredfold and the sixty and the thirty. Amen. Gospel chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. The disciples who were with the Lord were learning about His sufficiency, but they oftentimes forgot. When pressure came, they, they forgot. And they didn't pray, as our brother said. But in chapter 4 of Mark, uh, it says in verse uh, 35, And the same day, when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. When they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is quite a striking passage of Scripture, and what an experience. These disciples who had been spending time with the Lord Jesus had to really get to know about him and his ability And yet they were put into a situation, and so was the Lord, of tremendous pressure. And what caused them tremendous anxiety. And they were, the Lord is is in perfect peace. The Lord is at rest and able to sleep on a pillow. Talk about the perfect faith of that blessed man. Perfect faith. Yet at the same time, he is a divine person. And it's very interesting that these same men who are with him in this ship are put under the same pressure. The same disaster ensues in their lives. What's their response? Their response is not peace, resting in God, not in the least. Their response is to come waking him up, saying, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care? The same, re- the same attitude, the same attitude that Martha had had, Don't you care? And so we see a tremendous response of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus knows they have fears, knows they have great anxiety, but he first rises up and calms the storm. He first addresses the great need in their lives, and then he addresses their heart condition, their attitude. First, he knows the reality of their anxiety. And, you know, we have a, we know of a couple, and I'm sure you've read about in the PB group. I was talking to Brother Elias, uh, Brother Joseph and Sister Basima, who live down in North Carolina now. They were posed with a great disaster in their lives. Brother Joseph has been diagnosed with uh, lymphoma, cancer. And they found it in his bone marrow. This is very serious, very extreme, like this situation, very extreme. They could have responded in two ways. They could have said, Master, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing, that he's dying? Of course the Lord knows. Of course the Lord cares. But, you know, it's wonderful, the grace of God, how he's worked in their lives. They didn't say that. (laughs) They didn't say that. They're trusting in God. They're believing God for the circumstances of their life. They know the possibility. They know the possibility of what could happen. But they are believing God. Unlike these disciples 
who came to the Lord, Master, don't you care? (laughs) Of all the ones, of all the ones to ask that question, they're asking him. They're asking him because it seems to them like this situation is out of control. And obviously, it seems like you don't care because it's out of control and you're not doing anything. (laughs) And this is how it is in our lives sometimes. Sometimes when the circumstances seem out of control, we begin to question God. And the great question arises, why? (laughs) Why me? Why these circumstances? Why these troubles? And so here, the Lord knows our hearts. That's the beautiful thing. He knows in these, he knows what's going on in here. Even before we verbalize anything, even if they never said it outwardly, they may have said it inwardly. Master, don't you care? And they come, they bring this question before the Lord. They arouse him from his rest. He was able to rest. And the Lord immediately answers to the matter. He arose. And I believe that this says arose. It just doesn't mean he woke up. The Lord arose to answer to the need. He answered to the need in their lives. There was an immediate need. They needed something to calm their fears. Because I've, I've heard about this. A brother was sharing with me what happens over there. Maybe some, some saints here. Brother Elias maybe has been a little closer to the Sea of Galilee than I ever have. But those I've heard speaking about this say that because of the location of the Sea of Galilee and because of the Mediterranean, there's certain winds that come in. And because of the combination of the cool and warm air, a storm can arise in the Sea of Galilee within a matter of an hour. And not just a little storm, a severe storm. And sometimes even on the magnitude of a small hurricane, that kind of violence. And so how interesting this is, they may have begun their trip, it was nice and calm. This happened, I believe, with Paul in the Mediterranean. They started out and they had a nice south wind blowing softly. But you know, things can change in our lives. We might have in our lives, we might be believers, we're going along, we're cruising along in life in our little ship, as it were. And all of a sudden, a storm arises that scares us and brings us to our wit's end, as it says in Psalm 107. They're brought to their wit's end. Your wit's end is when you blow, you're at the end of yourself. You're, you've run out of resources. There's nothing left. In you, you have no capacity to deal with the problem. And the Lord sometimes in his wisdom does this. He brings us to our wit's end, to the very end of our resources. So Why? So that we cry out to him. Not cry out questioning, what, Lord, do you care? But that we would cry out to him in confidence and trust, in faith. Believing his ability to answer to every need. Whether it's a need for grace. Whether it's a need for a miracle. He's not incapable of that. The Lord is capable of doing whatever he pleases. Whatever is according to the mind and will of God, he's able to do. And we heard this earlier. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so with this situation, this was not an impossible situation for the Lord Jesus. (laughs) It was impossible for the disciples. They had no power to change weather. They could not. They could not. They could cry out to the wind all they wanted to. And the wind would have blown and said right back to them, you have no power over me. But the Lord Jesus, he arises up and he speaks a commanding word. As it says here, he rebuked the wind and he said unto the sea, peace, be still. Who else? Who else can speak to the wind and to the sea and they obey him? Who else has the authority that creation obeys his word? The very creation submits to his word. So when we come to anxiety, and I'm sure some here have had a lot more reason for anxiety than I have in my life. So I'm not really speaking from great experience. But I'm just saying what I've learned in the word of God. And I trust that when I do have some big experiences... I can rely upon these things that I've learned. And I think that's what the Lord wants us to do in Bible readings that we've had. 
that when things come in our lives, when anxieties do come blowing in at us, that we don't all of a sudden have to grapple about and say, dear, I've got to find something in the Bible. Know that we have the Word of God. That when the pressure comes, we, the, Lord's, the Spirit of God can take the things that we've learned and say, look, look at what you can trust. You can trust in the Lord. You can trust in His Word. Isn't this what Jehoshaphat said? They were posed, if anyone remembers this in Chronicles, they were posed with a huge, huge military onslaught coming against the people of Judah. And they cried out to the Lord. And all of them were there. The little children, all the families were all there depending. Depending on God. And what was Jehoshaphat's attitude? He depended on the Lord. He didn't have to run around saying, dear, I've got to find something in the Bible to help us now. No, he knew, he knew from the word of God that the people of God had had experience with God and they knew that they could depend on God in their trial. And so what did he say when a pro- the Lord caused a man to rise up and speak to encourage the people? He was a Levite. Just out of the crowds, the Lord caused this man to rise up and speak a word that the Lord would give them the victory that day. He said, you shall not have to fight in this battle. Stand still and see the salvation of God with you. And what did Jehoshaphat tell the people? Believe in the Lord. Believe his prophets. It's his word. It's what God has said. And this is what we need. This is where the resources are in these days. We need his word. We need to believe his word. Don't be like these disciples. It says the Lord says to them, why are you so fearful? And what does he say? How is it that you have no faith? Now, these men believed in the Lord, all except Judas. These men believed in the Lord. The Lord says to him, how is it that you have no faith? They were not exercising their faith. They were not exercising faith in God's word. So we can be just like them. We believe in the Lord Jesus. But when we have cause for anxiety, do we all of a sudden forget? (laughs) Do we all of a sudden forget that the one that we believe in, the one that we love, we can trust in? We can have confidence in? We, We believed him to save our souls from hell and to grant unto us life eternal. And to give us unto us great and precious promises, but we can't believe him to carry us through a trial in life. Then that verse applies to us. How is it that you have no faith? So may we not be like this. May we learn from this example to have faith, to believe his word, to trust him, and to be occupied with him. What's their response? And they feared exceedingly. We don't need to fear now. This perfect love of the Lord Jesus has cast out all fear. But we are amazed. We should ever be in awe. What's it say? What what do they say? What manner of man is this? Do we ever marvel at him? I hope so. <laughs> I hope we marvel at him. I hope you are, you and I are in awe at this person. We should never become casual with him. He is majestic. (laughs) He's almighty. He's infinite in wisdom and power and majesty and glory. We should be in awe that even the wind and the sea obey him. Angelic hosts obey him. He's the head over all things to the assembly. God has put everything in his hands. We can trust him for every detail of our lives until we meet him face to face in the glory. And what a day it will be. God bless his word.